So last time, we might as well just start. We, we, remember, this is a class. It's interactive. It's not a seminar. So to ask questions, I'll repeat questions on the audio and we'll talk about them. Uh, last time, we, we went to my standard model that I love so much of like fitting a line. And we talked about fitting a line. I'm going to reintroduce a little bit of it now because we this in this class, we're going to talk about information theory. So how well can you measure the properties of the line? And like, so let me say one more thing. This class, this, today's lecture is going to be pretty theoretical. It's kind of about the principles underlying the data analysis. Then next class, we're going to talk about something incredibly practical, which is how in practice you put error bars on your measurements. So, but this class is going to be about like how in principle well could you do if you had the best possible measurement. Um, and uh, so that's why this is information theory, and this will be a theoretical. So this is more theoretical. And then next week, we'll talk about something extremely practical. The point of this class is pragmatic data analysis. So it is, that is the goal, is to do practical things. Um, OK, good. So uh, let me start by reminding you that the, the, of the model we had last time. Mm, before I do that, I guess I just want to say, let's go, let's, let's just introduce information theory a little bit more generally. So we spent this whole week at Flatiron, we had a meeting of people who are trying to measure the velocities of stars incredibly precisely, what's called EPRV in the business, trying to find, measure uh, uh, the very small velocity shifts of stars, given that they have planetary systems around them. And that was a workshop all week. And we were particularly talking about details of like how you deal with the atmosphere. But one of the questions that came up in that is, how well should we be able to measure the velocity of a star? And you may have heard that the very best uh, radial velocity measurements in the world are about one meter per second, meaning if you have a very well-behaved G star, a star similar to the sun, and you measure it with an extremely good spectrograph at very high signal to noise, and you have that spectrograph with the right kind of calibration information on it, and you have a beautiful data analysis type pipeline, people can get here. But from an information theory point of view, Thanks very much. From an information theory point of view, we can show that we should be able to do with these best instruments something like 0 0.2 meters per second, and or maybe even 0 0.1, but it, substantially better than one meter per second. And the, there's the, a lot of the issues that we come up with, like that we as astrophysicists encounter, are these issues that you do not do as well as you think you should. And this lecture is all about how well do you think you should. That's what this lecture is about. And then next week, we're going to talk about how well are you doing empirically. Like, because it's also quite hard to determine this, as you can imagine. Because if you measure the star many times and you find that there's this variation, do you really know that that's noise? It could be a signal, whatever. Like, there's issues of how you actually decide what this is, too. Um, uh, and so really, I should say, this is like the, the, the root, the RMS, the RMS of the radial velocities is something, one meter per second. So the idea of information theory is how do we compute this number? And hopefully that will be obvious by the end of the class. If it isn't obvious at the end of the class, remind me and we'll come back and actually look at how we do it for a radial velocity spectrograph. Um, and in principle, Megan and I are writing a paper about this. Um, so I actually have to know the answer to that. Um, uh, good. I have some references. Oh, in the notes. So in the, in the, remember there's running notes for this class, which are at the running note. First of all, there's the syllabus for this class, which is dwh.gg slash flatiron cda. And that, at that URL is the syllabus for the course. If you're not on the email list, that's how you join the email list. Uh, that's how you get building access. I guess you successfully got building access. Um, and then uh, there's another document, same URL, but FCDA notes. And that's a place where if you open this up now, you can take notes on this lecture if you want. And then there's some notes that other people can share. Or you can also throw into there questions that you want answered. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions in the future. 
um, or by email or whatever. Um, it's just a place to keep some notes for the class. Okay, good. So uh, I wanna return to my fitting a line example and then hopefully it will be obvious how it projects onto all sorts of other things. Oh, by the way, there's an, the place that information theory has been used most in astrophysics up till now is uh, projections for cosmological experiments. You know, that people say, oh, uh, in the, in the you know, W prime, W plane, you're gonna do supernova studies will tell you this and baryon acoustic feature will tell you this and, and so the combined uh, information will look like this. You've seen plots like that in millions of talks. Those are generally information theory results. This is generally saying, here's what kinds of noise model we have for this experiment. This is the kind of noise model we have for this experiment. And then this is what we expect to get when we combine them. So if you read the endless white papers about uh, W first, Euclid, uh, uh, EBOS, and so on. Now, of course, once the experiments get real, and they really have data, they get a different answer here, but often it's not that different, and that's one of the things we're gonna talk about. Um, okay, good, so uh, uh, returning to our model, remember we had this very, very dumb model last time, which is we have a set of data that have known X positions and then some measured Y positions, which I'll be careful to draw heteroscedastic, and uh, we're trying to fit a line to these, and if you recall, so now remember, I defined a set of uh, linear algebra operators here. Uh, there, I defined the data y, I made y into a vector, which is all the data points. And, and I turned the x values into a vector. And I made a design matrix, which had ones, and then had the x values, and then the model, the objective function became chi-squared was data minus the model times the parameters, the model or what, what you might call the design matrix times the parameters. This is a column vector transpose dot C inverse Y minus MW. That was my objective function for the fit. So all rings a bell? Good. Great, that's what we did last time. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then I said, I said various magical things about this. And one of the magical things I said was that you can find the, the optimum of this objective function in closed form. It's just this very simple thing that the, the, you're trying to get the, I mean, if you're a mathematician, you would say you're trying to find the argmin over W of chi-squared and that is, that ends up being this very simple thing, which is M transpose C inverse M inverse M transpose C inverse Y. So now I've just recapped all of last lecture, but all of this is very relevant to us because this thing is going to be an object in information theory. Oh, right, I haven't said what C was, well done. C, C inverse is one over sigma one squared, one over sigma two squared, thank you, one over sigma three squared, dot, 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 with zeros everywhere else. Which is an idiotic object. As I mentioned last time, you would never actually construct this object uh, in real life because it's so sparse. So there's a computational question there of how you avoid constructing this object, which we will talk about in future classes, I hope. There's another, there's many other amusing, things. well, anyway, hopefully I'll come back to some real world. Don't let me forget to come back to some real world linear algebra things. Because I'm gonna throw around linear algebra things, which are, like you might think that if you were doing this operation, you should apply the inverse operator here, but that's not true. You should never use the invert operator in your linear, like if, you're, if you ever have in your code, Python, like NumPy, Linalg, invert, you're making a mistake. So, uh, uh, so there are some like details here there which we'll come back to over the semester. Oh, one of the points of this class is to be pragmatic. We're actually gonna learn how you actually manipulate expressions like this eventually. Um, so I will wanna talk about that, but anyway. Um, uh, 
Oh yeah, so this, you may recall at the last class, oh, so what is W? W now, I've implicitly defined W here. W is, impl is implicitly defined by this operation. M dot W gives a prediction for Y. So that means W is the intercept and the slope of our line. That's the, it's the intercept times X plus x times the slope, right? So this is the intercept and slope of the line. And then somebody in class last time pointed out that this object is C, well, depends where you put the inverses. Let me just be very, very careful. C inverse on W, the inverse variance on W is this object, M transpose C inverse M. Meaning this thing contains inside it one over sigma b squared. Well, I shouldn't even call it sigma b squared. Let me, let me be really, really careful. CW inverse, inverse. The thing you might call CW is, let me be very careful, is sigma b squared, sigma m squared and these weird off diagonal uh, correlated uncertainties. And in general, you will have correlated uncertainties because in general, this vector of ones will not be orthogonal to that vector of x's. If these two vectors were exactly orthogonal, meaning, what's the definition of orthogonality? This is the dot product operation. This is the dot product operation. You dot through a C inverse. So if you dotted the ones through a C inverse to the X's and you got exactly zero, then these off diagonal terms would be zero. That's the sense of orthogonality. Because if these two things dot product to zero, then there is no sort of crosstalk between the intercept and the slope. But in most linear fitting applications, that will not be true. And so in most fitting applications, these will not be non-zero. Okay, good. Everyone with me so far? Questions? Yes. Does the, will the orthogonality condition be different if any different Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, if you notice, notice that this operation is the dot product. This is a, this is, I've transposed M. So this is now M is, M transpose is now a pair of row vectors and M is a pair of column vectors. So here I'm just taking the four dot products. This is taking four dot products between the two vectors and the two vectors. The self dot products give you these and the non-self, well, I've inverted. <laughs> I've also inverted, but anyway, in the inverse, uh, the, the dot products give you these and the, uh, the self dot products give you these and the non-self give you those. Uh, so you get an exactly diagonal matrix only when this thing delivers zeros, which means this and this are orthogonal. That only happens if the data have a particular footprint in the X space and the right error weightings. You can imagine if you even if your data were evenly distributed across zero, like roughly speaking, these are orthogonal if the X is average to zero, right? So, so you can imagine you have your data evenly distributed around zero, but then you just increase the error bar on some of these points and decrease some of these points, and then they're not orthogonal again. So every data set defines its own sense of orthogonality. And by the way, in the cosmology community, there was a lot of exploitation of that in the 90s and the OOs. In the 90s and the OOs, there was a lot of work on like making KL decompositions of galaxy surveys and then measuring the large scale structure in the orthogonal modes. And they were orthogonal with respect to the data, not with respect to God. The Fourier modes are, are orthogonal with respect to God, but, the, but then in any survey that a human does, uh, there's a different concept of orthogonality, which is fundamentally this concept of orthogonality. And that, there was a whole literature about that. If you're interested in that, in the cosmology community, there were these papers that talk about KL modes. I think, I think that's the key word. I'm not exactly sure what the search keyword is, but something like that, where, where the idea was to recast large scale structure as an ortho, ortho, orthogonal problem. And then the cool thing is, once you're orthogonal, 
um, data analysis becomes a lot easier because, for instance, this inverse becomes trivial. And, and, and it means that all you really do when you measure the amplitude of a mode is just project the mode onto the data. And you can project them all independently because you know they're all orthogonal. Um, uh, good, did that overly answer your question? Good. Yep. <laughs> Good question. We're going to try to be principled. I, I'm a notation pedant. I, I've just mentioned pedantry before because um, I'm a pedant about geometric properties and also notationally. I think we should call CW a covariance matrix. And in, for reasons we are about to see, I think we should call CW inverse an information matrix. Um, and this thing, as we emphasized last time, and because of all this geometry stuff, is also a metric. Also a metric tensor. Has a me metric properties. Good. Good. Glennis is asking, does this actually have to be diagonal? In this simplified problem, we made it diagonal. In practice, these aren't always diagonal. And in fact, like for instance, if these are fluxes, if these were fluxes in a Kepler light curve, they, this would not be usually diagonal because we do a set of processing of the Kepler light curves that like removes modes, which effectively couples the values. When we've subtracted out those modes, we've effectively coupled, we've moved points together. And so there's effectively off diagonal. And actually some of the work we did on Kepler was to write down a correct covariance matrix for the data once you'd done that correction. Um, so, right, in general, there, there won't be zeros off diagonal here, but a lot of experiments, a lot of projects that people in this room do assume that this off diagonals are zero. Often that is a good assumption or a useful assumption. And as you're going to see over the arc of this class, I'm a big believer in making useful assumptions. It's more important to make useful assumptions than correct assumptions, uh, which is going to sort of feel like a joke, but it will not be. Um, and... Uh, uh, and then there are a lot of experiments in which they really are zero. There really is no connection. If these measurements are taken by different instruments, you know, on different nights with different photometry, you know, like with different photons, they're really truly independent. Sometimes like you have very strong causal reasons to know that the off diagonals are zero. Uh, like it would violate quantum mechanics or whatever for them to be non-zero. Um, Okay, good. This is a set of definitions. This is all stuff from last time. Uh, this literally a recap of last time, but it's because these things are so important. So, so now, what we're about to, here's where the plan of the lecture. We're about to, I'm about to assert, not prove, though there's a nice proof on, on the wiki, on the, the, the document that has the the um, syllabus, I put a link to two pieces of reading. One of those pieces of reading is a Wikipedia page about Fisher information. That Wikipedia page contains a proof which is labeled informal. <laughs> um, but it, from our perspective, it's a proof um, that this covariance matrix is the best measurement you can possibly make given the data. It's not, so when you, you, when you say, oh, this, this thing I've computed here is the uncertainty on my fit, that isn't quite right. What you've computed here is the best possible uncertainty any fit could ever have. And so when you assert that this is your uncertainty on your output, you're asserting that you're perfect. Well, to that model to that model. And so if Glenna said to that model, and that's a very important point, because one of the big themes of this is if you want to compute how well can you measure a radial velocity or how well is some cosmology experiment going to do, 
you have to make incredibly strong assumptions. And what we compute here is only going to be as good as whatever assumptions we make. So it is true that this is, remember we wrote that list of assumptions last time. We assumed that the noise was Gaussian, everything was independent. We knew the noise variances. The data really were generated by a straight line. There were no outliers. Like we made all those assumptions. If every one of those assumptions is true, then sure enough, this method that we've done here is correct, and it does generate something with this uncertainty. So you, when you say that this is your uncertainty, you're asserting that all of your assumptions are true, which is why I think it's always better to see this always as a lower limit to your uncertainty. Your uncertainties are almost always larger than this. And they're larger than this for a lot of reasons, but most of them are because the detailed assumptions you made to get here are wrong. They kind of have to be. There's no way your noise is exactly Gaussian. There's no way you exactly know all the noise variances. There's no way that the straight line fit is a perfect fit to all your data. There's no way there aren't outliers. You know, there's there's, there's, there, there's no way that you know all these X values exactly correctly. Like there, there's just so many things that can go wrong and every one of those will increase your error. It's, none of them will improve your precision basically. Or you have to be very adversarial to find changes you can make here that increase your precision. Um, okay, good. So let's just talk about that. Let's, do, let's just get to the Fisher information point. Good. Um, if you want to sound important and sophisticated, we talked about last time the word heteroscedastic, which is a good word to use if you want to appear. Another way to appear uh, sophisticated and knowledgeable is to ask somebody whether their measurement saturates the Kramer Rao bound. And I don't know if we teach this in, in the NYU physics curriculum, but, but I was taught this by a string theorist at Caltech when I was a grad student. There was a mathematical physics class for grad students, and part of it was information theory. And it turned out to be like the most important math I learned in all of that mathematical physics class. I learned all this group theory and things, which I never used. But the information theory, which at the time I was like, what is this about, um, has turned out to be really important. So the kramer rao bound, is a bound on the variance of asymptotically unbiased estimators. So this is truly a frequentist thing, the pure frequentism, but it says that if you have an estimator, and remember this thing I've partially erased is an estimator, it takes the data and gives us a value for the, the slope and intercept of a line. So this is an estimator that estimates slope and intercept given data. Um, the kramer rao bound says that the variance of any estimator, I don't know what symbol I should use for my estimator, um, I'm going to write estimator. The variance of any estimator you make in your data has to, and this is, there are conditions on this estimator, meaning uh, asymptotically unbiased, it has to have certain properties. After all, you can make a very low, if I want to estimate everyone's height in this room, I can just say everyone is 5 foot 11. That, that estimate has no variance but it is not unbiased because I'm not actually making any use of the data at all to figure out your height. Um, uh, so the, this, this estimator has to meet certain properties where it uses the data and it is unbiased given the data and things like that. But anyway, the best variance, the variance of this estimator always has to be greater than or equal to one over the information. And remember, the information is the inverse variance tensor that in this context, so you see how this exactly meets that. We're saying that the uncertainty is the inverse of the information. So we're claiming this saturates the bound, but now I'm going to define the information more generally. And the information is the expectation over possible data sets. So we're, we're going totally statistics -y here. We're not going to really use the detailed statistics here, but it's the expectation over the, the, the all possible data sets. And that already makes you realize we're going to need to know about how the data are distributed because we need to do an expectation over data sets of, for our purposes, there's different forms of this, but for our purposes, it's d squared, d theta squared, where theta is the parameter we're trying to estimate 
um, of the log likelihood function for theta and a minus sign. Just got to get that right. Yes, there's a minus sign. Okay, so what is this saying? So what is L? I haven't defined. L of theta is the log likelihood. And remember, what's the likelihood? The likelihood is the distribution for the data given parameters. So once again, we need to know the probability of the data given parameters. And I'm switching to calling the parameters theta here because that's a standard thing in the stats literature to call the parameters theta. I called them W over there. Um, but you know, W and theta, they're kind of similar. Uh, anyway, the, uh, 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 so and this is the likelihood, the probability of the data given parameters. And then th you take the log of it, you take the second derivative of the expectation, that's the information. Now, what, what's this magic? But it's actually not magic at all. You can think of the likelihood function if you just had a really nice simple problem, like that simple problem, you find that in the theta space, the likelihood function has a really nice sort of Gaussian peak. In fact, if you have the linear least squares model with Gaussian noise, it's literally a Gaussian peak in here. And the, at the top of this, you can see that the, the sort of uncertainty you have on this parameter in your likelihood is basically the curvature of this function. And if you take the log of a Gaussian, it becomes a parabola. So the log looks like this, right? And then the curvature here of the Gaussian is the width. The curvature of the parabola is the width of the Gaussian, or the inverse of the curvature. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, get, incorrect units, correctly united. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so what it's right. So Glennis is asking this is kind of obvious in the diagonal case or in even better, it's really obvious in the one dimensional case. It's extremely obvious. And then if everything's diagonal, you can split it into a set of K diagonal of one dimensional cases and everything's cool. So the remarkable thing, which I'm not going to prove, is that when you generalize this to vector calculus, you still get the information that is appropriate for that k-dimensional space. And it relates to the fact that everything is geometric here. We're geometry safe. Remember I said, I said I'm a pedant about these things. This really is a vector. This really is a metric tensor in that vector space. And, and the original data really are a vector, and this really is a metric tensor in the data space. So we really do have geometry at our disposal, and that means things that are geometrically correct are allowed. And so the geometric generalization of this to vector calculus, this is like a 1D calculus, this is calc 1, now we're going to go to calc 3. This becomes a vector calculus operation, and it is the correct calculation. It is the tensor second derivative of the object, gives you the information tensor for those parameters. You have a situation where you had giant correlations, but if the actual RMS measurement was accurate for each one, they track the information. The off diagonal case would be huge. This will still give you the right answer. Of course, what happens is that when you invert the correlation function, when you, in, in order to actually compute your errors, right, this is an inverse covariance matrix, right? So if you actually want to know your errors, you have to then invert this thing. And when you invert it, the off diagonal elements you have there come in and make big changes. In fact, I want to talk about that immediately right now because it's such an important point. So let's go back to our fitting a line. Now let's imagine here's the, the, remember the parameters B and M also form a vector space. So I can think of my best fit B, like remember I did this M, the thing I've erased right here, the ghost here, that returns a location in the space, which is my best M and B value. And then I have this tensor, I have this tensor, which I just erased here, which is 
sigma b squared, sigma bm, sigma bm, sigma m squared, that tensor, that tensor, the, what, what is in a vector space, what does a tensor look like? It looks like a, it gives you the properties of an ellipse. This tensor has two eigenvalues and two eigenvectors, right? Remember that? <laughs> you know, the funny thing is that you can be a physics major at NYU and you, the one place you learn about eigenvalues and eigenvectors is in coupled oscillators. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but that means you can think of this as defining two vectors, which are the major and minor axes of an ellipse. And so this thing translates into an ellipse in this space, um, which in general will be highly covariant. If the off diagonal terms were zero, then this thing would be axis aligned. So it could, if you wanted it to be zero, it could look like that, or it could look like this. Then it would have zero off diagonal terms. But if it has off diagonal terms, then it's not axis aligned and it has some orientation. So your general case looks like this. Now, I want to be really, really careful. If you only remember one thing from this lecture, here is the one thing to remember. We had, this is the covariance matrix. Associated with this covariance matrix, I also had a C inverse W, an information matrix, which had some values A, B, C, D, which, well, actually, it's actually has to be A, B, B, C, um, which I am being unspecific about. By the way, these tensors, they have to be Hermitian. You know, remember Hermitian? Yeah, they have to be Hermitian. In fact, I assert, although one of my particle physics colleagues at NYU disagrees, I assert that any tensor that appears in physics has to be Hermitian. Fight me. Anyway, um, uh, uh, if I think, Sometimes, sometimes you don't want to invert this matrix. Imagine you did this linear fit and it's got 100,000 free parameters. You can still do that linear fit, no problem, because it's a convex optimization. So give me 100,000 parameters, go to town. I can do 10 million. In fact, when we calibrated the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the number of parameters was limited by the amount of RAM we could buy on a chip. Um, and uh, so you can, optimize huge things. But if you have that huge matrix, you never want to do this inversion. You never want to go, this is easy to compute. This requires a matrix inversion. So sometimes you don't want a matrix invert. So sometimes you might want to say, you might be tempted to say, oh, that's one over sigma b squared. That's sigma b squared. That's one over sigma b squared, right? It's like not at all. And let's talk about exactly what that is. This is literally the most important moment today. Here's the most important moment. This, if I project this Gaussian down onto the B axis, right, I'm going to get a Gaussian that's wide like that. And if I cut this Gaussian through a cut, you see, I get a really nice narrow Gaussian. If I cut it, if I sliced it, I get a narrow Gaussian. If I project it, I get a big Gaussian. This width here, this variance is the, this variance is set by sigma b squared. So this width is the square root of sigma b squared. And the width of this narrow thing, this width, is one over the square root of A. You with me? That's why you have to invert it, even though you can't afford to. You still have to. And one of the things that's interesting about this is, um, if this is a huge matrix, you can't afford to do the inversion, but you have to do the inversion because of this, because otherwise you're saying the wrong error, not the right error. Um, so there's a lot of work 
especially over the last 30 years, of approximations to inversions of large structured matrices. And that's like a, just a huge area. And if you need to invert a very large matrix and you don't know how to do it, there's a huge literature on different kinds of approximations that can be done. So for instance, one community that's struggling with this is Gaia. The ESA Gaia data is of order five parameters on of order two billion stars. So this matrix, which they can easily compute, they literally can compute any element of this matrix, is something like 10 billion by 10 billion. So now they don't ever represent that matrix because that would be dumb, but they have code by which they can obtain any elements they want of that matrix. Because it's not that hard, it just involves dot producting design vectors, right? There is the design matrix, you just dot product design vectors and it gives you these values. So you can get any value out of there that you want. And so a lot of work has gone on in the Gaia team about approximations to what this matrix must look like, given what that matrix looks like. And that's a beautiful subject and people wrote entire PhD theses on that. I was a reader of one of them. Um, that's Barry Hall, who is here for the Gaia Sprint. He wrote, if you look up the name Hall, you'll see some, on Gaia, you'll see some beautiful work on approximating the inverses of very large matrices, much larger than you've ever had to encounter. Like at that size, at the size of Gaia, you can't even write this matrix down. Uh, um, good. Uh, where were we? Ah, yes. So if all you want, th so this relates to, this relates now to how do you present your results or what are your errors or whatever. Your uncertainty on the slope or the intercept, this is the intercept, I guess. Your uncertainty on the intercept, if you want to be conservative, is this uncertainty. If, however, God tells you that the slope is exactly two, then you can just slice this at two, and then this is your uncertainty. And so this relates to a very important point. So I've, I've kind of mentioned a few things. The one thing I mentioned a little a moment ago is that there's a lot of assumptions that go in, meaning in order to get to this point and write this error model, we had to believe all of the assumptions we wrote down yesterday. There's no assumption-free measurement of the information. Notice we have to take an expectation over data of a derivative of a likelihood function. So you have to have a lot of assumptions about your problem to even compute this thing. Uh, let alone execute, let alone like execute or believe it. Um, so there's a huge number of assumptions. And then the second thing is your belief, your noise model depends on what you're willing to let free. So in this fit, when I fit and I allowed M and B to have arbitrary values, this is my associated uncertainty on B. If however, some other piece of information tells me M, then that allows me to slice this and then my errors on B become much smaller. And so this relates somehow to the concept of nuisance parameters. And now at the risk of insulting my cosmology colleagues, I will point out that when people are comparing Euclid W first and EBOS, on what their constraints will be in the WW prime plane, it depends very, very much what nuisance parameters you allow to go free. If you plot these believing you know sigma eight, it's very different than plotting these believing you don't know sigma eight. And even worse than that, there is kind of observational systematics, like, like do you calibrate your survey believe your calibration and then measure this? Or do you believe that your calibration might have residual uncertainties in it and you have to simultaneously fit your calibration and W and W prime? If that's the case, then those become nuisance parameters and they will in general inflate the size of your contours over here. Um, for exactly this reason, like this is a beautiful geometric argument that the more I know about M, the more I know about B. Uh, and if I don't know anything about M, what I know about B is 
the best I can know about B is what's given by this tensor. So the, this is the thing to re remember, if I have to boil this down to one thing, it is that when you do this linear fitting, you get left with these tensors and they're that uh, there's a tensor and it's inverse or a tensor and it's inverse, but whatever, there are these two tensors. You have to be careful about which one you're using. Exactly. Really, yeah, good. So I should have written this like this. And then both the scalars and the vectors will be happy. No, it's certainly not diagonal. No, you have to do the matrix inverse. Ah, uh, I'm assuming your estimator estimates a vector and the variance of a vector is a tensor. So good. So I'm, the, geometrically, we're assuming in general in this class, we, I think almost nobody in this room is estimating a scalar quantity. <laughs> actually, the funny thing is in radial velocity exoplanets, we actually are. <laughs> it's like the only thing in this whole room where you're measuring a scalar. Uh, but in most cases, we're measuring a vector. There's all the cosmological parameters here. And so then the, the thing that comes in here is the tensor, which is the variance around that vector point or the variance in that vector space. Is that any good? The, the geometric interpretation of this, Glenn has asked about the geometric interpretation of this in high dimensions. In high dimensions, the geometric interpretation of this is that any estimator has to be large, has to make an ellipse that contains this ellipse. So it might tightly contain it, or it might not, but it has to contain the ellipse. That's the geometric generalization, yeah. Yeah. So it can be said in the sense like if you consider a variance on M, you are like increasing the variance. Good, the question is, you mean if you have a measurement of M, Good. There's, a, there's generally a concept in statistics of shrinkage that if you know anything, you know everything better. There's just generally a concept that, that knowledge propagates through your system because, because your, your world is a graph. And so if you improve your knowledge here, there's actually links. So it also improves your knowledge here. So, right. So this is really just, th these are just the two extreme ends of I have some information about M. And you can imagine, by the way, there, this is a place where Bayesians and frequentists can just start to get in trouble because it looks here like we integrated. If you project down here, technically you're integrating in the parameter space, which remember, frequentists aren't allowed to do. But this is still a well-defined frequentist error. It's called, so in Bayesian inference, this process is called marginalization. So this would be the marginal distribution in B. And in frequentism, this is called the profile distribution. Meaning you, you've, the concept of the profile is you sweep through M and consider what you know about B at every value of M. And that delivers this, this, this object here. Um, uh, so there's, there are, there are, this is, this is, has different, inter the, the, this geometric operation actually has slightly different interpretations in frequentism and Bayesianism, because Bayesian, uh, only Bayesians are allowed to integrate in the space. That is super subtle and doesn't matter to anybody's research, I think. If it does, you're in the wrong class. <laughs> Um, uh, most people in this room, I think, are probably Bayesians, and then you can just think of this as projection. Um, uh, good. Uh, yeah, anyway, if you want to look up, if you, if you want to learn more about frequentism, and the weird thing about astronomers is they're more likely to know about Bayes than frequentism. If you want to know more about Bayesian, about frequentism, this word profile is one worth looking up. If you look at profile likelihoods and profiled errors and profiling. And so a big, people may know Kyle Cranmer, uh, here in physics. I mentioned him actually uh, last class as well, who's a particle physicist. He, he has built the, some of the profiling stuff for Atlas. 
and also some of the marginalization stuff for Alice. So he's actually right at this interface and I've learned all my frequentism from him. Um, uh, good. Uh, where are we? Oh yeah. Um, I want to say a little bit more about the properties of these matrices. And I want to talk a little bit more now. I, now I want to situate this like in a real problem. We're going to do a real problem. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. Oh, good. Tim's asking the philosophical question, which I'm about to punt, which is, which is why is the frequentist interpretation not the same as the frat player? Because technically a frequentist cannot do an integral in the parameter space. You're not allowed. You don't have a measure. Not always. If you get into non-trivial situations where there's a non-trivial likelihood, like the likelihood has a lot of structure to it, uh, then, then the, profile, the profiling operation and the marginalization operation under a flat prior will not, in general, give the same answers. But they both give very conservative answers. Like, they're both the conservative thing to do. And I don't particularly, a lot of the people I know who are Bayesians are Bayesians because you can marginalize, because marginalization is a really simple thing. You just run MCMC and then you just plot the axes you want and you've marginalized the others and everything's easy. Whereas if you're a frequentist, it's a harder way to live. But in the end, you're just as conservative. That's my summary, but it is not exactly numerically the same, especially in nonlinear situations. I haven't really thought as much about profiling as I'd like, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty confident about what I'm saying right now. In terms of, um, I think there, there are cases like this where they're identical, but they're rare. They're linear. Now I want to actually talk about nonlinearity. So we, we need to talk about a few things. We, we, I want to talk about what happens as this matrix gets very large, or you get into real world problems like cosmology, or radial velocities of stars. And then I want to talk about the real world problem that our models aren't linear. This is a trivial linear model. Let's talk about a nonlinear model for a moment and hopefully I'll run out of time. Um, okay, let's go. So first thing to say is let's talk about the, this. I mentioned a moment ago that if you have, say you have You've computed this CW inverse, but it's big. What does the word big mean? The word big means you have to think about your computation. It's computationally relevant. Um, now, there's several things. The first thing is, First thing I would say is you want to avoid at all costs running the inverse operator. The thing called inv. The reason is that the inverse operator, I, actually I don't really know. I'm about to say something where I go off the reservation. But I think it's because the inverse operator is trying to get the numerical object which is closest to the inverse of your matrix. But usually you only care about certain directions in the vector space. If this vector space is large, by assumption, you actually don't care about all directions in this space. You only care about particular parameters or particular directions. And then rather than invert this, you want to run solve operations against the directions you care about. That is, you don't care so much, you don't need, so here's the next observation. You don't in general need CW, you need CW dotted in to various vectors. In fact, often what you need, sorry, I'm just moving need here. Often what you need is this. There's some direction in the space you care about. You ask, how well are we measuring sigma eight? Well, sigma eight is a direction in your vector space. What you really want to know is just the uncertainty on sigma eight. That's the inner product of the sigma eight unit vector through this object. And this operation can be done with the solve. This can be done with solve 
C inverse comma U. Three, instead use the solve operator. So that is a bit of a subtlety. This is a bit of a subtlety, but there's a bunch of people in this room who are probably currently making this mistake. And we, every time we've audited our code for inverse and replaced it with solves, we've always improved everything. It's generally faster, slightly, and always more accurate. Um, so that's just a piece of random advice. Um, now I want to just say a little one piece of one reasoning why this piece of advice is relevant. But are there questions at this point? This is a little odd. I've gone slightly weird here. Getting computational. There is computational in the name of this course. Yes. Are there clever algorithms for doing the entire operation? Right. You don't even care about solves in WU. You kind of care about the dot product of transformation. Uh, Luger is asking whether there's a fast way to do the whole operation. Since the dot only adds an n squared, and this is going to be n to the 2.6. From a scaling perspective, it doesn't hurt you to do the dot on the outside. Um, but I don't know the answer to that. There, I think certainly in structured cases there are, when you have structured matrices like Gaussian or G GP kernels on toplets form, you can just pull out elements of the inverse matrix like directly. And that's the tricks that are behind some of these fast Gaussian process codes. Um, but, uh, but no, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, how big does this CW matrix have to be to make sure we're in charge? Like, just like Good. Good. That's a great question. The question is, how big does the C have to be for me to worry? I'm going to say a few words about that now, and I'm going to be very, very annoyingly vague. But I will, I will say some things about that right now. Because the, um, and one piece of advice I have, though, is if you're not sure, then treat it as if it's big. But I'm going to give you a test right now for it. Um, uh, yeah. In all standard linear algebra packages, there's an operator called solve, meaning in LinPack and and all the custom things that people build for things, and the solve a comma x returns this returns a inverse x a inverse dot x and and the reason that it's better than inversion is it tries to get this object to be as numerically close to the answer you want not this object and that's why it's better the other thing is it's very easy to represent such operations as optimizations what this thing does under the hood is optimization um, and uh, one of the things that's funny is sometimes people mention to me, oh, we're not really optimizing, we're not really doing the closed form, we're doing an iterative optimization to solve this problem. And then I like to point out to them that even when you do things in closed form, under the hood, the computer is doing an iterative optimization. Like if you have ever inverted or solved with a matrix, you've done an optimization. Because if you look under the hood at what that code is doing, they do optimizations. I think the very best code, special case, low numbers, and then do everything else with optimization, like up to six or something at special cases, and then it does something like that. I don't really know how they work. One of the crazy things is so much work has gone into these operators that you would never be able to write one that's as fast as what's out there. Like if you tried to write it and read did a, a couple of years of reading and like tried to actually write the best solve operator you possibly could like the lin, lin lin pack solve will beat you by a huge factor they're really smart these things and by the way if you're doing things that are big in a sense which we will come to you should make sure your computer has the best linear algebra packages compiled onto it so uh there are most, for most hardware, there's special purpose versions of the linear algebra packages that are faster on that hardware. And like assessing whether you have the right packages on your hardware is actually slightly non-trivial. But if you do it, you'll actually get a speed up. I, I'm not sure what the current status of Macs is, whether Macs have 
good lin packs on them, you know? Yeah. Okay, good. Wolfgang is saying that if you use conda and uh, numpy, you get good linear algebra. Um, okay, good. Uh, let's talk about the bigness of CW. I guess I want to say I have two more comments that I want to make. Let me just write them here because I'm going to forget them if I don't make them. One comment I'm going to make is what's big. And there's two senses in which a matrix can be big. And we're going to talk about both of them. Only one of them is its actual size. And then the other question is, what do I do in nonlinear problems? And there's two issues in nonlinear problems as well that I want to talk about. So that's just my outline so I don't forget. Okay, let's talk about bigness. So the first thing, the first thing that you should know about a matrix like this, and if you naively, if you naively construct this information matrix. So imagine you're just doing cosmology. Actually, I want to do, I, would, I should get like a better version. Okay, so here's an example. Anna Bonazza and I wrote a paper about information theory and stellar streams. So we're asking how well could you use a stellar stream to figure out the properties of the Milky Way. And the properties of the Milky Way are things like what's the dark matter density in the, in the disk? What's the ellipticity of the halo, you know, asking those kinds of questions, like dynamical questions about like the dynamical state of the Milky Way. Those different parameters are measured in different units, right? The dark matter density was measured in one unit. The ellipticity of the halo is measured in a different unit. Some of those units are very far from order unity. Some of those units are by definition near order unity. The Different things have different units. And notice that means that this object, think about the units of this object. What are the units of this object? Well, it's the derivatives with respect to parameters of something dimensionless. So that means the, each row and column of, if you go to an element of this, it has the inverse dimensions of this row times the inverse dimensions of this column. So do you see why that is a huge red flag? That's like red flag orama. I mean, I'm literally doing dynamics right now in SI units. And if you use SI units, I don't know why, but if you use SI units, like velocities, accelerations, and positions have orders of magnitude difference if you're talking about the Milky Way. So um, the first point is that this generically, generically, CW inverse will have terrible condition. There's something about a matrix called its condition, which is just jargon. And I, I, I only use it because it's the keyword you're going to search. And the condition number of a matrix con, which, by the way, most linear algebra packages have a condition number function. But anyway, you can write your own, as you're going to see in a moment. It's really trivial. The condition number of C inverse is the ratio of the maximum eigenvalue to the minimum eigenvalue. If you have a matrix that's bigger than a few by a few somewhere in your code, just go and compute that condition number. It is extremely illuminating. Uh, and when Anna, Anna Bonanza and I, when we were doing this problem, we were having trouble like getting numbers that seemed sensible and we couldn't figure it out. So then we computed the condition number of our matrix and it was 10 to the 40. It's like really easy. It's really easy for this to be 10 to the 40, right? Because you just change units. As I change units of my parameters, the condition number just goes to hell. Yes. No. <laughs> oh, good. Very good. Uh, Mehmet asks, what's a good condition number? Um, I'm not going to answer that. Well, one, one is a great condition number. Basically, if your condition number is one, 
um, then then you can just invert away everything's good. Now you will never get a condition number of one. By the way, oh, there's so many things to say here. If you, you obviously can change the condition number of a matrix. I'm gonna say what's good and bad in a second. How do you deal with this? Imagine your condition number is 10 to the 40. What do you do? You panic or you go drinking because <laughs> you're never going to solve this problem anyway. So what people do is they call it's called preconditioning. What you do is you wrote, you take your matrix into a new basis in which the condition number is better. Okay. So now what you can do is you. You can buy a shear. A general affine transformation. Oh, Think of. Rotation, right? Good. Yeah, I, I, I implied rotation because I said we're going to change basis, but I'm being very, very general here. If, remember that. Yeah, good. But, good, but I, I want to say it for the room, which is that look at this. Imagine these were plotted in different units. Imagine B was measured in microseconds and M is some dimensionless slope or whatever, then this thing could be hundreds of thousands in this direction and it's like 0.25 in this direction. Then the condition number of this matrix is going to be hundreds of thousands or millions in that case, right? Um, because it's gonna be the ratio of the, actually the eigenvectors won't be aligned as I've plotted them here. The eigenvectors will point a different direction, it's weird. But then anyway, then you can see that if I could mush, I could, I could shear this space and if I sheared this space to make it more circular, the condition number would be better. And the shearing that would make it perfectly circular would be the inverse. You see how the perfect way to condition a matrix is with its inverse. The only way, in fact, you can get a condition number of one is to shear with the inverse. So, so, um, so there's a gen the general statement is what you do here is you find a new basis, which is generally not just a rotation. I'm writing R, but it's going to be not just a rotation. It's a shear or whatever. Um, and you do this. You do this to the matrix, and then you check the condition number. And if you're a lot better, you've made an improvement, then you can invert and un- and then change basis back. This is just a basis and then you invert and then change the basis back. Um, so that's in general the approach that people take, but the dumbest thing to do, the dumbest thing to do is to make this matrix just a rescaling of the coordinates. If you just rescale the coordinates so the magnitudes of the entries are comparable across the rows, you usually do pretty well. There are still pathological cases, and when you hit a pathological case, it becomes a research problem, and you have to do it well. But, but the most important thing is to work in a unit system that makes your matrix more, better. And now, now finally, this is, that was all a preamble to saying that you want this to be less than something like 10 to the 8. I'm just making that up. Certainly when we go past 10 to the eight, we start to see problems. When we're well below 10 to the eight, we never see any issues. I don't really know what this is. It depends on the precision and it depends on some details and it depends on what your goals are. You know, if you only care about the large eigenvalues of the matrix, then you, you can be looser with this, it depends. Um, but if you want like good performance along all, all axis, you want this good. And this must have something to do with machine precision. Probably this has to do with the fact that machine precision is of order 10 to the 16. And so probably somehow it's that, but I don't know. Yeah. Is this essentially what they do in machine learning when they're training neural networks that they get good condition matrix? Yeah, they, um, uh, yeah, Wolfgang is asking when people in machine learning talk about getting good condition at matrices, that's exactly what they're talking about. Exactly. That's why there's a lot of work in machine learning where people take the data and they like pre-whiten the data in some way. They like make the mean and RMS, mean zero and RMS one along all axes. And it's because empirically they find that their matrices are better behaved in that case. There are obviously better things you can do than that, but then they become research problems again. Yeah.
this this does preserve the uh, the question is but you have to preserve the correlations this does preserve the correlations if you do this rotation you invert and then you rotate back by the inverse rotation well not rotation whatever there's a coordinate transform here you have to preserve your coordinate transform and do the inverse of that when you're done which is just like that so you do you do your solve step on this um, and then you apply either R or R transpose out here, do the right one, R, I think, or whatever, <laughs> or R inverse, or whatever. Anyway, there's something you do out front to transform back. I'm being unspecific. Um, the, in, the reason I don't, I, I, I'm not, I don't have my linear algebra right at my fingertips is that in fact, in all the problems I do, we just rescale the units. And so you just remember the unit scalings and then you just unscale at the end. Yeah, you do. It has to be R U here. Oh no, R transpose U. I think uh, one of those. Do the right one. But yeah, the, the, that's why the the thing you have to do is um, the thing you have to do is uh, is scale everything in your problem to the new units. So think of it really as a units change in your code. So you have to scale all these vectors down, all of these rows and columns down by the scales and all of these, this vector down by the scales. Do your solve step and then scale things back up to the units in which you're gonna make your plots. And it is really easy to make a bookkeeping error. Oh my God. <laughs> So when you do this, if you, if you really want to get computational, you should set up unit tests. This is an extremely good place to have unit tests. <laughs> I hope you're not shaking your head no because you don't think that's true. <laughs> you just don't want to. No, I know. Nobody does. Um, okay, good. Questions at this point? Yes. Even, good, the question is what about if CW is dimensionless? There are, because of course, these parameters don't all necessarily have dimensions. So it can be dimensionless, but that doesn't mean that the condition number is good. So even if you have dimensionless parameters and a dimensionless problem, it still can be the case that one parameter has a huge effect on the data and the other, another parameter has a very slight effect on the data. And then the rows and columns of this will be very different. And then this will have this huge problem again. Or another problem that comes up, which is related to that is your problem only really depends on the sum of two parameters. And so the sum of the two parameters has a huge effect. So it looks like both parameters have comp comparable effects, but in fact, they are only affecting your result in their sum. And then you have bad condition number again, because they're difference doesn't matter, only their sum, and then you get bad condition number again. So that, and then you really have to rotate. Then is a case where rotating helps, uh, yeah. but rescaling doesn't help in that case. That's why rescaling the axes is just your first line of attack. One thing that's very important though, is that in general, you can't interpret this very well. Like you get a bad condition number, you kind of like, eh, it's probably units issue, but you don't really know in general. If you knew why this was happening, you would know your inverse matrix. Like there's a, it really is, you really can't know in some sense why this is happening. And so if you look at the preconditioning literature, it's all ansatzes. It's like, it's all like making guesses about things that can be going wrong. And then the preconditioners do things that are consistent with those guesses. And pr general preconditioning systems are very complicated. They're like, Try lots of different things. It's bad. Yeah. Good. Yep. Yeah. 
Okay, good. The first question is, even in low parameter models, won't you in general get this? The answer is yes. That's why there's two senses of the meaning big, and I've only answered one of them. Um, in general, yeah, if, and if you can somehow make a plot and you see that your likelihood function looks like this or your posterior looks like this, it does suggest that maybe you should be using the difference of these two and the sum as two different parameters rather than these two parameters. Meaning, often when your condition number is bad, if you start to make plots, you'll realize, or even just think about the problem. Sometimes you just think, oh yeah, I've included this angle and this angle and they're perfectly degenerate and you realize that you can then combine them into one angle. Um, so, so the first statement is yes, sometimes there will, these will be caused just by parameter covariances. Then you ask, but why do I care? So this should happen. This does generically happen. It is generically the correct thing. The thing is that no linear algebra package can actually do anything with this matrix that's correct. Because once you have a condition number that's bigger than machine precision, there's no adding of off diagonal terms onto other terms that makes any difference. Like if you think about what's happening under the hood in, in the row reduction, I mean, look, these things don't do row reduction, but you could imagine doing row reduction. Row reduction just wouldn't work if some of the numbers are 10 to the minus 20 and some of the numbers are 10 to the plus 20. Like you just, meh. So you have to fix this numerically, even though it's real. Yes, sir. Yeah, good, good, good. Sarab is bringing up the point that's called pivot, which, and I think I've, I've erased everything relevant, but, but yes, imagine you're fitting the slope, the slope and the intercept of a line like this, and here's the zero, so here's where the intercept is happening, and all my data are here, right? Then I can, change the intercept to meet the data, or I can change the slope to meet the data. But the, the, the fact that this is a parameter over here is kind of stupid. And what you should do is recenter your problem on your data. So you could translate your data over to here, or you could translate your origin over to the data either way. And that will enormously improve the condition number. So that intuition is absolutely correct. And that also relates to this point that a lot of it is about these dot products. These things are dot products of model components. So another thing you can do if your condition number is bad is just look at dot products of your model components and just ask, is anything going wrong here? Um, and you should see in that case that the slope model component and the intercept model component have an immense dot product. And so you're just, that says you should repivot the data. And actually in the statistics literature, there's whole literature about how you automatically repivot your data, like automatically move your data to a better place, do your fit and then move it back, which is very related to conditioning. That is a very relevant, was that relevant to your question? Is that what you were asking? Sarab. <laughs> You just went to your happy place there. <laughs> Good. Um, now, there's another question about what's big, which is literally just the size of your, of your matrix. So again, if your matrix is, has good condition number, but it's huge, um, you actually won't have the correct condition number probably because it, you have to do a lot of linear algebra to even get these values, whatever. I, I don't really know where huge is and that's a moving target. When I was a kid, it was like 10, 10 by 10. You couldn't rely, like when I was a grad student, you could not rely on taking an, uh, linear algebra operators on 10 by 10 matrices. Now I think it's more like a thousand. So I think at a thousand by a thousand, I think standard hardware does okay with linear algebra operations, but I don't think it's good at 10,000. I don't know. I don't really know where the breakdown. Actually, other people in the room might have a sense. Like Luger, do you have a sense of when linear algebra breaks down at what number of, I mean, at some point it, it, go, it goes like 2.6. It goes like end of the 2.6. So it goes, it gets bad and then it's impossible. Like very quickly after it goes bad, it goes impossible. Um, uh, but one of the ways I, I remember testing a long time ago when I was a grad student, I just did something where I just had some data and I just fit a higher and higher order polynomial and at some point the fits just weren't going near the data. And that was a way to see that the linear algebra just failed at some point. And it was, and back when I was a grad student, it, it was like 10 or 12. 
Um, um, good, so those are the two answers to what's big. This is the one that people don't usually think to check. It's so important. Actually, some of the work that I've done has real errors in it. We, we released a software package that did not check for this and then people used it and got wrong answers and wrote a paper saying our software didn't work. So like this has real world uh, implications. Um, good, uh, good. Now I wanna talk about the other thing which is nonlinear models. So right now I've only talked about very trivial linear case. So now let's just think about the nonlinear case just for a minute, because I just want to bring up two things. There's nothing really different about the linear, the nonlinear case, but there's two things I want to say. I might even try and preserve that um, formula there. So in the nonlinear case, there's also non-Gaussian non -Gaussian likelihood functions. There's a lot of different things to consider, but they all kind of fall into the same kind of category. Like the math here was all very simple in the linear case because this is an expectation over data of this curvature of this second derivative. But in the linear case, this second derivative doesn't depend on the data. Did you notice the data didn't appear in the second derivative? It, it was only these, the only thing that appeared in the second derivatives was these products of model components to the things. But now, once you go to either a nonlinear model or a non-Gaussian model, now in general, this derivative will depend on the data and where you are in the data space. So, so there's, two, there's two kind of questions when you do, that come up in nonlinear things. So in a nonlinear problem, the nonlinear problems I usually think about are like y minus g of x given parameters, where this is a general, function that outputs a vector like y transpose c inverse y minus g of x given parameters. So that's kind of my picture, but you could also go to non-Gaussian likelihoods or you can go to uh, likelihood that includes outliers. Like imagine you want to throw outliers into your problem, uh, like cosmic rays. Now all of a sudden your likelihood function is weirder and then the second derivative depends on where you are in the data space because you hit the second Gaussian in certain parts of data space. So that, that things get a lot harder when you go to a nonlinear model. So there's two things. One is, in principle, you're supposed to do an expectation over data. Now, there's this question of, do you do that at fixed parameters or not? So if you're a frequentist, you have to do an expectation over data at fixed parameters, because as a frequentist, you're not allowed to do integrals over the parameter space, so you can't do anything else. So that means in this context, if you're a frequentist, you have to choose what you might call the fiducial model. You have to choose where in the model space you're gonna work. And actually in the cosmology community, they argue about this a lot. They argue about what should they use as the center point of their uh, cosmological model when they do this expansion. You have to decide, are you gonna work, are you gonna like, have a non-trivial cosmological constant or not when you do this compute when you do this computation like are you going to work with a w prime or are you going to work whatever so you have to make a choice here and that choice will matter because there'll be some parts of your space where the data are more informative and other parts of the space where the data are less informative so that is an issue and i'm just leaving it there because i have no recommendations of any kind um uh, in the, you know, if you're, it, and you know, if you're, if you're writing a white paper for the decadal survey, there might be certain choices where, where polemical properties of your choice compete with scientific properties of your choice, uh, which is something to look out for when you read those white papers uh, next year. Um, the other, uh, the other comment I want to make is that there's an issue of taking numerical derivatives or how do you take derivatives of this model? And there are two big issues here. One, one is if you take, ideally you would like to have analytic derivatives. So let me just write analytic. Analytic of course is, doesn't mean the same thing for mathematicians as us, but anyway, you know what I mean by analytic. Analytic versus numerical derivatives. And 
what do I mean by a numerical derivative? By a numerical derivative, I mean you like move the model slightly, look at the change in the expectation of the data and divide that change by the change in the parameter, right? Like you literally like, you know, delta F over delta X. So first thing I wanna say is whenever you take numerical derivatives, you always introduce noise. You always get a noisier derivative. And when you add noise into your derivative, here, now you wanna get subtle, let's get subtle. When you add some noise into your derivatives, you make your system believe there's more information than there is. Now let's see why. So imagine, imagine your, if you took the numerical derivative, so remember th this numerical derivative is a, a vector. You're taking the derivative of this with respect to all these parameters. Imagine there's some parameters that matter a lot and some that don't matter very much, but your derivatives are noisy. Then what will happen is it will believe that the data depend on this parameter more than it does because your derivative is noisy. And that means when you do these outer products of the, or these inner products of the derivatives with themselves, you get a number which is larger than you would expect. So when you take numerical derivatives in problems like this, you will in general overestimate the information in your problem because there will be numerical noise in your derivatives and that numerical noise will look like information. It's actually, it's, it's, so Glennis asks for a little clarification. It's not exactly that sign, it's the opposite sign. This is about the information matrix. But, well, it is very related. It's extremely related to the point that if you misestimate your errors, you, you, yeah. Yeah, so what this does is this, what this does is it increases, if you have numerical noise in your derivatives, it increases the sensitivity of the data to the parameters. So then it makes you think you have information in the data about your parameters that isn't really there. Another way to point, do, to think about it is if I put in random numbers for my derivatives, it'll look like I have lots of information because it'll look like the data depends strongly on the parameters. Um, so, uh, there's a very big issue with numerical derivatives here. And, uh, and the reason I'm saying it is because Anna Banatz and I spent a long time struggling with that problem because we were in a situation where we can only have numerical derivatives. That situation is changing really rapidly right now because you might think, oh my God, I don't want to go through my whole code and figure out the goddamn derivative of everything with respect to everything. And it's true. You don't want to do that. Machines can do that for you. And the, the big breakthrough that's happening in computation these days is called auto diff. And there's various different packages with different names, but this is a not a terrible keyword. If you look up auto diff systems, it can literally take your code and give you the derivatives of your code in the form of code with respect to your parameters. And the reason that this is possible is a very fundamental thing in calculus which is that taking derivatives is easy, integrating is hard, right? You can, if, you, if I write down a horrifying function on this board, you all can just mechanically through a set of typographical rules differentiate it. If I write that same function on the board, none of you will be able to integrate it. The integral won't even be known. In fact, even if I give you something where the integral is known, it's very hard to find often. Because so integrating is like solving an encryption problem and differentiating is like decrypting. So differentiation is easy, integration is hard. So that means if you have code, you can actually write code that just takes the derivative of the code and people have conveniently done this for you. And even NumPy has a decorator system that will take derivatives for you. So you, some of you will have to change your practice to take advantage of these, but as time goes on, it's becoming easier and easier to just take whatever code you actually have and just take the derivative of it. Yeah. Say again. Oh, right, what do I mean by analytic here? What I really mean is closed form. So I really should call, whenever I say analytic, I mean closed form, meaning my derivatives are also just computed deterministically by the code, just the way the model is. That's all I mean. Um, and uh, yeah, we shouldn't use the word analytic here. 
because analytic has some other meaning in calculus, which I don't even know. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, the something words, God, I'm lost. But anyway, uh, 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 in principle, there's no reason you shouldn't have closed form derivatives for everything you do going forward. Yes. Yeah. I know, uh, good. So the question is like in the same B. So in, in principle, imagine this is the CLs and this is the prediction of the CL variances given like the cosmological parameters. Can I just get the derivatives for that? The answer is conceptually yes, whether anyone's actually done it. I haven't done it yet. I've not done it, but you are. Okay, good. We should talk because, because in fact, I think it's probably possible to take whatever code is out there and decorate it in a way that it would be able to do this. And I could also use it for other things myself. I also need some derivatives on, on things. Um, uh, however, sometimes it's a big engineering problem. It, there is an issue that not everything you write in code can be successfully differentiated. So there are some gotchas, certain kinds of conditional operations that you can do. It's hard to take a derivative through them. Like just simple if statements are cool, but if you get to more complicated things, more complicated conditionals, there can be things that can't differentiate, um, which there's, there's writing on the web about this. But I'm almost certain that a CMB, so for instance, one of the things I did way back when I was an undergrad was write the derivatives for an n-body integrator. So we had an n-body integrator that could integrate the solar system, and then we also integrated the derivatives because we needed them to do inference. I had to write them by hand, but when I wrote them all down by hand, which hurt, I realized a computer could have written these down and then I never did anything with that thought. I, I would be rich and famous now if I had. <laughs> um, uh, no, it's a really straightforward idea. This auto diff is a really straightforward idea. As soon as you see it, you're like, duh. Um, but in principle, it could really save us from a lot of problems. Um, Everything we've done here, I haven't emphasized enough that everything we've done here has assumed that we have a likelihood function and that likelihood function describes how the data are generated. As this becomes wrong, everything that's written in this lecture is wrong. And so whenever anybody says, oh, we can measure this to this quantity, to this pro precision, like we're working on with EPRV, they are definitely making a lot of assumptions and you can actually start questioning them about their assumptions and you often find that there are assumptions that are really questionable. So the goal for next lecture is what do we do when we don't believe our generative model of the data? How do we put errors on our quantities that were of interest when we don't believe that we know how the data are generated? That's what we're going to talk about next time. And the crazy thing is there is actually good engineering and statistics around that question. So we are going to talk about things that have a good backing in the literature. We're not going to, it's not going to be hacking. We're going to be doing something that's principled when you don't know how your data are generated. Okay, good. I'm done. No clapping. <laughs>